with that, today's communion, we are going to go through um, seven benefits of justification. Now, there's a million benefits of justification, but today we're just going to go through seven of them. So if you have your Bible, um, let's turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, starting in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings out Perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom whom we have now received the reconciliation. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises that are in it. We thank you that you will fulfill all of those promises. Lord, speak to us now as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, as today as we kind of partake in communion together, I thought it would be good to kind of meditate on uh, the outcomes, some of the outcomes that happen be, or are happening or have happened because of Jesus going to the cross, because of his sacrifice. <coughs> to meditate on the, the profit or benefit or result or blessing, whichever word we want to apply to it, um, because Christ died on the cross, because he is raised again. So, Last week we talked um, briefly, we had the question, you know, as we were going through what Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and the question is, you know, well, what is it going to cost me what a, what a, to follow Jesus? What's the cost that I have to really, okay, do I have to do this? Do I have to do that? For Well, the bigger question, and we talked about this a little bit, was is don't ask that question. The bigger question is that we should be asking everybody else that are not following Jesus is what's the cost if you don't, if you don't follow the Lord, what, what's it going to cost you in the end? You know, when everything comes to a head, when Christ returns, what's it going to cost you if you didn't follow? So with that in mind, we're moving forward. So today we're going to, we sit kind of, all together before a holy God and we know that we are sinful fallen people and we know that we have a list a laundry list some of them are rolled up at the bottom of the floor like mine of sins that uh, we've done 
problems that we have caused between us and God, we understand that that list of sins that we are all guilty of those sins. Guilty of those sins. And because we are guilty of those sins, those sins condemn us. Okay, those things that separate us from God, those things condemn us. But through the resurrection of Jesus, through him dying on the cross, right, we now have eternal hope. God doesn't take that long list um, and count our sin against us. <laughs> oh, you got this one and you got this one. And he kind of goes through, not for us that are following the Lord, that has been wiped away from because Jesus came and died on the cross and is resurrected. He died for our sins. So now the judge that is looking at our rap sheet, if you will, goes, oh, and throws it away because of his son, Jesus. So now instead of standing guilty in front of the judge or a holy God, we are justified. Okay, and we're going to get into that. Justified by faith. That's in our first verse. Therefore, having been justified by faith. Now, we're going to go into the seven benefits or blessings or however you want to call it um, of justification. But before we do that, let's understand a little bit, just a little bit, because you're going to have to come to a Thursday night to find a lot more out about justification. So I'm going to give you a glimpse here this morning. Justification is the act of God where he declares that a sinful person or a guilty person is righteous or now not guilty based on a belief and trust in Jesus Christ rather than the person's own good works. It's not, oh, I did all these bad things, but I did these good things and it kind of one for one wipes things out. No, this is God saying, Nope, I'm taking all of this guilt, and now instead of guilty, we are justified. We are changed from a state of guilty to righteous. John Calvin called justification the main hinge on which true religion turns. And that's a, that's a pretty big statement. But we'll see that without justification, nothing else can happen. Nothing else, because things are so intertwined with each other, there must be this justification. Martin Luther says, This article of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, is the head and cornerstone of the church, which only begets, nourishes, builds, preserves, and protects the church without it, the church of God cannot subsist but one hour. So we have a concept of justification that it's that removing our guilt, okay? It's us, that list of sins is now gone away. If that doesn't happen, <laughs> this church, this body doesn't continue forward. God's going to continue forward, but us, we don't, okay? We are justified, declared righteous at the moment of our salvation. Jesus, Jesus finished the work of all of that required for our justification on the cross. And by faith, we, we receive that justification from God. We have to understand that justification solely comes um, from the Lord, solely comes through Christ. We can't earn it. It's a free gift given to those who would receive it by faith, okay? So justification only comes through Christ. Romans 4.25 says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions. I'm going to stop right there. The he is Jesus. He was delivered over to be sacrificed, okay, for our transgressions, for our things that make us guilty, and was raised, so now he's died, he's raised because of our justification. If Jesus didn't rise again, the whole Christian faith is a farce, but we know for a fact that, that he has risen. 
And because he's risen, that is our justification. See, justification demonstrates the, the grace of God towards us. It, we're, we're, we were unable to keep the law. The law was something, you know, he gave to his, to his followers and said, keep these things. And they tried and tried and tried. They tried to make up new rules and extra rules and everything. They could not keep the law. Well, that's, that's sinning. If you can't keep the law perfectly, then you've, you've missed the mark. And now because of that sin, we still have this separation or thing that this guilty charge that needs to be removed. But that sin, that guilty charge, always carries the penalty with it. And the penalty for sin is death. But with justification, with justification comes the removal of the penalty of sin. Galatians uh, 3, 24 says, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. So we look backwards, okay, to see things point towards Jesus. Then once we're at Jesus... Everything goes through Jesus. So, really, we could spend a lot more on justification, but we're going to move on. Like I said, come to a Thursday night, and we'll dive into that. Today, as we study uh, these passages for communion, I mentioned I wanted to pull out seven um, prophets, not the a prophet like Elijah, but benefits, you know, things that we receive back or blessings the first one, that as we go through, it says, I want to pull out is peace. We have peace with God, our verses say. Peace with God. Justification with God gives us peace with God. See, because in our sinful nature, in sin, there is nothing but enmity between us and a holy God. <laughs> There's nothing that we have in common. There's nothing, anything. Without justification, we stand guilty and condemned. So peace, guilty and condemned, that is not a peaceful place to be before a holy judge. Without justification and the change of that verdict from guilty sinner to washed righteous believer, there can be no peace with God. Isaiah says, there is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. That is straight from God's mouth. It, the, the sinful, the ones that have not been justified, there is no peace for them. But God. Those are some of the two verses I always love to find two words in the Bible. Whenever you're going through something, there seems to be something catastrophic, something super horrible and but God. And then all of a sudden, the sun comes up, the clouds go away, right? God changes the verdict of guilty, wicked, and degenerate to righteous. No longer guilty or at enmity with God, we can have peace with him. Peace with him. Colossians 1.20 says, And through him, Jesus, to reconcile all things to him, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things are, are on earth or things in heaven, the peace with God the Father comes through Jesus Christ, through his blood on the cross. See, the blood of Christ, Christ, oh, wow, having a hard time pronunciating today. The blood of Christ removes our filth so that we can stand with the righteousness of Christ. Not our own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness before a holy God. If we were not justified, we would still be guilty. And guilty doesn't last very long in the presence of God, right? That's not a good thing. But because of Jesus, we gain peace with God. So that's the first thing that we're we're looking at is peace. Ephesians 2, 13 to 14 says, but now in Christ Jesus, 
you who who were formerly who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall this is awesome because we see that now we can have peace with the father through Christ and then we see this process that Jesus is doing the he broke down the barrier the dividing wall not only between like Jew and Gentile but between us and God he broke that, broke down that separation which brings us to the next point that I want to bring out is access to God. So the second benefit, the second blessing that we have from justification is access to the Father. It says in our verses, through our Lord Jesus Christ. So building on the fact that we can now have peace with God and that we can enter his presence, obviously we can now entering his presence, we have access to God the Father through Jesus. Our verses, it, it's awesome. It says it a few, a couple times, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom you have, whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into his grace. Access to the Father is through the Son, through Jesus. And see, this isn't a new concept that that is happening. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so putting all that stuff together, we know Jesus is God and God is Jesus and Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And so we're not, we're not trying to get into, into that, but now the, the holiest of holy or the holiest part presence of God, we can, through Christ, enter into that holy of holy. So when Jesus died, right, it, this is this is where it all falls. Jesus died, the veil was torn in two. The veil was torn from top to bottom. And we have to remember that the things of the temple, all of the things in the temple were shadows of things to come and they all ultimately point to Christ. It's amazing when you do a study on the things that Jesus said, I am this, I am that, and you put it together with all of the elements that are in the temple. He is all of those things. But the veil, the veil was the constant reminder. It was that separating curtain, a constant reminder that sin renders us completely unfit for the presence of God. We are unfit for the presence of God. And that veil was, hey, stop here. Okay? But Jesus broke down the barrier of the dividing wall between us and God. So now through Jesus' death, the old veil is torn in two. Jesus now, in a sense, since we're, we try to do pictures here, in a sense, Jesus becomes the new veil of the temple because he actually is the entire temple but this new veil or christ has an open door policy <laughs> right so to go to the holiest of holies through through jesus it's just yeah you want to come to me matter of fact he's beckoning us he's calling us he's urging us to go to him through christ so we have access now to God through Christ. Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. And there's, there's the Trinity right there in one verse. Through him, Jesus, we have access to the Father, right, in one spirit, the Holy Spirit, and it's all... It's not, I'm not going to say it's all the same, but it's all linked together so that it works in harmony with everything. That access, that word that we're looking at, access to the Father, is um, 
prasagagi, or prasagagi, however you want to pronounce it, it is the privilege of approach. That's what the word means, this word access. It's the privilege of approach. It's the assurance in our relationship with God whereby we are acceptable to him and have guarantee that he will be favorable at our presence, right? So before, if we went into a holy God past those curtains, they would tie a a rope around the priest's ankle and nope, you weren't ready to go in. And they would just have to, you know, drag them out when the bells on their, you know, whatever they wore, you know, robes stopped jingling. They're like, nah, Zeke didn't make it. Let's pull him out. Okay. So that is gone right now. We have this, this access, this privilege of approach. If you guys remember Esther, right? And you guys haven't gone through Esther yet in um, in the Bible recap. So Esther, Esther actually became the queen, but the king had this this rule. He had a, a scepter in his hand, and if he was in the mood, he would pick up the scepter, and then people could come in and talk to him. If he wasn't in the mood, he would the scepter wasn't in his hand, and if you came into the presence of the king and he wasn't buying it off with your head didn't matter that's the rules for a king okay even if it's his wife esther was worried about oh if i go into the presence of boy and he's not in the mood talk about a bad marriage okay (laughs) but seriously to go into the presence you had to have that privilege of approach god is the king ultimate king he's the king of heaven he's the king of earth and places that we don't even know about through jesus at any time now at any time we have the privilege of approach we have the access to god the father Third thing I want to bring out is hope. Hope. We exult in the hope of the glory of God, it says. We exult in the hope of the glory of God. See, this world today uses um, the word hope in totally a different manner than the biblical manner. For the world, it's wishful thinking, right? Right? wishful thinking. I, I hope I get a new barbecue for Christmas, right? Or in my case, I hope that the Cowboys win the Super Bowl. So now you really know that it's totally wishful thinking. Okay. That's, that's hope according to the world. It's, it's man, I don't know, just flip a coin and maybe, right? It's all wishful thinking. But the biblical definition for hope, our definition for hope, is a confident expectation. Think about that. A confident expectation. Hope for the Christian is not that wishful thinking, but an assurance. It is the assurance of of things to come that God has promised. Our hope is in the return of Christ. Actually, Our hope is in Christ, not just his return, but he's the one that holds our hope. And we are confident in the fact of Jesus, which is our hope. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4 says, Blessed be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Man, that's awesome. Jesus isn't in the grave anymore. He's he's not buried. 
he is, he's alive, alive. That, that alone, that fact by alone by itself is truly the definition of our living hope. Jesus is our hope. He is living. That hope is our confident expectation. So when the world says, oh, I hope for this, I hope for that. Well, that's a worldly hope. Our hope rests in Christ and our hope is an assurance. Moving on in our verses, verse three, and not not only this, but we exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations bring about perseverance, perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given us. Hope is great. And and this hope is actually going to lead us into the next point. But getting there, justification. Let's look at this. Justification gives us peace. It gives us, justification gives us access to God. Justification gives us hope. But justification now, with our hope, also changes who we are. 1 John 3, 3, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So the next, we just read it, point I want to bring out is Christ-like character or a changed character. Or if you want to do it exactly like it's written, proven character. Proven character, you see, All of these things so far are tying together. One thing seems to build on the other. Justification allows for peace. Peace allows for access to God. Access to God, now we have this living hope because Christ is alive. Okay? But all of this continuousness of everything, that's not the word that I'm making up yet, um, is what changes us. Changes us in, in our, our entire being. So it's only fitting that the next, this next point is Christian character, right? Or proven character. God changes us because of this justification. Titus 2, 11 and 3, 11 to 13 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly righteously and godly in this in the present age looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great god and savior jesus christ so being justified now his word reading his word now the guilt removed is he is instructing us to deny ungodliness that worldly desires right he's changing us from the inside just the even the fact that before i was standing guilty and now I am justified, therefore I am not guilty. That alone, I am a changed person. We are being transformed. Ezekiel 36, 26. God prophesied, it was just a couple, couple years ago, right? Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. We get a new character, a new character after we are justified, after our guilt has been removed. Second Corinthians, we're moving through. 517 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. I love the fact that we are a new creation, a new creature. So, 
really, we get that we're justified and that we have peace and access. I get that God is our living hope. Jesus is our living hope and that um, we're being changed. But by this time in the study, I figured everybody was probably kind of wondering, okay, how are we doing a communion message? <laughs> how is this applying to communion? None of these things would be possible had it not been for Christ and the cross. None of these things would even be remotely a thought if it was not for Jesus and his sacrifice. All this and more because of his sacrifice. Verse 6 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God, there it is again, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were helpless to do anything in our depravity, in our sinful nature, guilty before the judge, Christ died for us and took our penalty. He took our place. All of our sins, the punishment that we should have had, Christ took those on him. We have been replaced on the altar. Christ died on the cross, but the sacrifice normally is on an altar. Whether it's the altar or the cross, we have been replaced for that sacrifice. That's number five. It's, it's the idea of that substitutionary atonement. If you remember the example of Abraham and Isaac, okay? God says, hey, I want you to give me your only son. He says, Abe says, okay, come on, let's go. Isaac takes him up there, gets ready to sacrifice him, puts him on the altar, and got, he's getting ready to do it. And then the angel stops him. Isaac was replaced on that altar, right? That is a total picture of, of us now when we should be the one climbing up on the altar saying, okay, this is me. We have been replaced by Christ. It wasn't just a ram like in Abraham. And then we can't do it as just a ram or a lamb or whatever, right? Because Hebrews 10 4 says, For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats, or let me ad lib here, chickens or doves or whatever else you want to sacrifice. It's impossible for those things to take away sins. Jesus had to be the substitutionary sacrifice. Animal sacrifices were not sufficient, not even close to being sufficient. It was all to point to the one true, perfect sacrifice. <coughs> That's why it had to be Jesus. Because even if we were to die for our own sins, that wouldn't be sufficient. Okay? And then you think about the fact that if we're dying for our own penalty, then there's really no resurrection for us and so then there's no that's not it because we can't defeat death so now if we can't defeat death and we can't we have no chance of resurrecting that's why it had to be jesus he could defeat death he was the only one that could take our sins on his shoulders and literally nail them to the cross and they're gone isaiah 40 or 53, 4 through 6 says, Surely our griefs he bore, he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He's crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Man, we, we read this. And there's this one theme that pops out to me every time that I read this 
this verse. Our griefs, <laughs> our sorrows, our transgressions, our iniquities. Those are not all those are not good things. Those are all the bad things. But we didn't receive one stripe. We didn't get beaten, we didn't get the crown of thorns, we didn't get nails. We didn't receive one blow because we were removed and Christ was put in our place. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It should have been us, but... The blessing of justification is our sins were removed, placed on Christ, and now we stand before the judge not guilty because Jesus took our, all of our guilt to the cross. Verse 9 says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. So the number six, I told you I was going to give you seven things. Number six is Saved from wrath. That's a pretty good thing. Saved from wrath. If uh, Last week we talked about perishing, right? And how Alistair Begg says, I got to give you the, you know, the, the bad bits so that you understand, you know, the good stuff. You have to understand both because here it is, perishing. That whole concept of perishing when we don't accept the Lord as our Savior, this perishing also has God's wrath attached to it. That's the thing that we have to understand. It's not just dying and we're in the grave. It's death, the eternal death that we're talking about away from God is has God's wrath attached to it. So then... The big question when we start looking at this is, well, what is God's wrath? Okay, just death and then I know nothing and then that's it. It's, it's over. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. But we have to understand really what God's wrath is. And that's not a small question because there's eschatological wrath. There's cataclysmic wrath that God uses through nature and disaster. There's consequential wrath wrath there's abandonment wrath and then there's redemptive wrath okay so there's all of these different types of wrath redemptive wrath was the wrath that jesus received on the cross that saved us so this wrath that we're being saved on saved from would appear that it would help just to, if we're trying to categorize it, we really can't. We totally can't. But it would fall into the abandonment and eternal wrath of God. God is holy and just. And he must judge sin. So God's wrath at this point is a divine response to sin and disobedience. So those who are justified have had their guilty charge removed. Those who are not justified that are on the other side will be judged and consequently receive the full wrath of God. Okay? But what does that picture look like? It's not just, well, all of a sudden I die and I know nothing and it's maybe I'll come back as a butterfly, right? The earth, with God's presence, with the Holy Spirit present here right now, is there's good things that happen, right? The sun shines on good, saved people. It's good just as much as it shines on, you know, sinners and people that don't follow the Lord. But one day, the people that have not accepted him, God's presence, anything that's good and, and positive, will be removed. And you won't be just not conscious for that. You will be very conscious for 
God's presence not being here. And that is a scary thing. Jesus said there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a horrible place. But, but, there's the but again. Jesus says in John 3, 36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God abides on him. Okay, so that word abides, we talked briefly about it on, on our solitude walk, right? On, on abiding in Christ and staying in Christ. It's, it's you have moved into a house and you never leave that house. You are abiding in that house. It's the same concept with God's wrath at the end will abide. It will never leave never leave moves in and makes camp and it's not good but he who believes in the son has eternal life praise the lord that we are saved that's all i have to say thank you lord first thessalonians 1 10 says wait for the son from heaven whom he raised from the dead that is jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. It's, that's all of the wrath. That's the cataclysmic. That's the eschatological. That's the consequential, the abandonment, the eternal. When God pours out his cup that says it's full, or his bowl that's full of God's wrath. Man, I don't want to receive that. I don't want to be on the receiving end of that. That's why we cling to he who believes in the Son has eternal life. So, the last thing, number seven, that I wanted to bring out from our verses. Number seven is that we are reconciled to God because of justification, because of those sins being removed. Now we have the opportunity through Christ for reconciliation to the Lord because it would be one thing to just be saved from God's wrath not get it okay I'm not going to pour out all this judgment on you but there's this planet way over here that I'm not even going to be present on and I'm going to put you over there you could make up all sorts of things it would be one thing just to be saved from wrath but we don't want that we want that relationship with the father we want to be reunited the way that God intended us to be. It says in verse 10 that we are reconciled to God. We are reconciled through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, thanks Adam, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Thank you, Jesus. For as Adam, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will have be, been made alive. See, there was this, at the fall, when Adam sinned all of the sudden, there was this separation from God. A separation that we couldn't, uh, oops, I just wandered away and now I'm going to wander back. We, nope, that separation was sin. And it severed, that sin literally severed our relationship with God. It cut it off. We can't have, have should God not come down um, to us? We have no way of having a relationship with the Lord. Nothing. That, that relationship could not be mended without Christ. Okay? So Jesus died in our place and rose again to fix the disconnected relationship that we have with God. That is what's called reconciliation. Okay? Now, we have re easily reconciliation that we can have between 
people between humans. That's easy because we can get to each other. We can meet at Starbucks and talk about things and, you know, hash it out and be gone. But with God, we couldn't do that. It had to be Christ, the one to reconcile that relationship. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, Now, all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Without justification and the removal of those sins, we cannot be reconciled to God. Our relationship could not be restored. Verse 11 says, And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now receive reconciliation. I like that. But now we exalt. We exalt. We glorify. We revel in the fact. We rejoice. That's what this word entails. We exalt because of what Jesus did. And that's what we're here today to to take part in communion with, is to exalt in what Jesus did, how he justified us, and now we are restored. We have access to the Lord. We have peace with God. All of those seven things that we talked about today and countless other things. But those were the seven that were prominent in in these verses. We rejoice and glory in the fact that we are now reconciled to God. So, with all these things, uh, the justification, the peace of God, the access to God, our living hope, our new identity... It's in the fact of Jesus' atoning sacrifice that, that we can partake in this. That we're saved from God's wrath. It's with a reconciled relationship to, uh, to God the Father that we take time to be obedient in Jesus' command and take that time and remember. That's what we're doing. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This bread, his body, beaten, scourged, pierced with a crown of thorns, nailed to a cross, and all the other things, that's what this bread represents, is that body. It represents our hope and glory, just like we studied today. It represents our justification. It represents our reconciliation This bread represents so much if we just stop and remember. Just stop and think about these things. The one thing that this bread does not represent is our body. Our body didn't go through that. Remember, we were replaced. That's the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. We were replaced It's not us. That's why we remember this is Christ. Christ alone. So Lord, we we remember what you did and we partake together. Paul continues, it says, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a little cup. It's plastic. It means the cup means absolutely nothing. But what is in it, the juice in the cup, it's a representation of, it's a reminder of the blood of our Savior. This simple uh, symbol represents our, our hope of eternity. It reminds us of the atoning sacrifice that could only have been done by Christ, by Jesus. It re represents uh, propitiation to God with a sufficient, sufficient sacrifice. Jesus willingly and literally allowed his blood to be squeezed from his body in the Garden of Eden. I mean, not in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, he allowed his flesh to be flayed open by scourging by the whips. He allowed his flesh to be pierced by the crown of thorns and to be beaten. All those things, his blood flowed for us. For us. This cup should be a reminder that all of those things he did because he loved us. This cup also should be a reminder that just like the bread, this is not our blood. We did not shed one drop of blood or anything for our salvation. It's only Christ. So now, like we just ended our study, we exalt. We glory. We rebel. We rejoice because of what Jesus did. Let's partake. Lord, we thank you for your blood, for your bread, for your body that you sacrificed for us. We thank you for justification before the great judge that we will no longer be judged because you have removed our sins. Lord, and we looked at all the blessings, some of the blessings that we receive because you justified us. And Lord, we exalt, we glory, we praise you for all of those things. In Jesus' name, amen.